Hi there, welcome back to the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. My name's Veronica and today we have Peter Hughes, our Senior Curator of Decorative Arts, with us and we're going to do part two of our Not So Easy um, tour. But here we are today on, uh, in Tasmania, La Truida, and we're meeting on Muanina land. And I'd first like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and pay respect to the Tasmanian um, Aboriginal community as the traditional owners of this land. Hi, Peter. Hello. Thanks for coming Hello, back to us. Pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure. So for those at home who maybe uh, missed out last time or uh, just need a little recap, can you tell us a little bit about what this exhibition? Yes, yeah, just to make it very brief, uh, Not Too Easy is an exhibition about um, Australian design and identity. Uh, as a settler colonial society, Australia's always kind of struggled with design and it's been one of the most kind of interesting, I mean, not with design, sorry, with identity. Uh, it's been one of those sort of dynamics that has driven design, particularly in the last century since Federation, and still continues to be a kind of factor here. Great, so last time we finished up here, the post-war potteries, and today we're going to start where? Uh, just over here, but uh, I guess the, the kind of the segue here is that at the same time as kind of these fabulously coloured pots, uh, you know, vessels, ceramics were being produced uh, with native plants and animals and those kinds of things on them for, for a very popular market. Um, there was also a sort of parallel studio ceramics movement, which was quite international, but had an Australian expression as well, um, that kind of overlaps significantly. So we'll just pop over to the case over here. And uh, look at the work of Eileen Keyes, one of the um, early uh, pioneers of Australian um, studio ceramics. So Australian studio, I mean, studio ceramics Postwar Studio Ceramics was very heavily in, in sorry, it's all good. Um, was kind of an interesting um, uh, phenomenon. It was it was partly uh, part of modernism, so that was about kind of if you think about Jackson Pollock, you think about abstract expressionism, you think about the idea of spontaneous expression, and also the truth to materials. So um, as a kind of international movement. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to think about how you can find Australian identity, expressions of Australian identity within it, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, it's very, very heavily influenced by Oriental ceramics. So one of the earliest sort of Australian practitioners was a woman called Eileen Keyes. She was originally uh, born in New Zealand, but um, moved to Western Australia um, with her husband, I think probably in her 20s. And she, her, her living in Western Australia coincided with a couple of things. One of them was a massive shortage of materials after the war. So ceramicists couldn't get imported materials from everywhere. And also a mining boom in Western Australia that kind of produced all these kind of fabulous minerals if you had the right connections. So Eileen Keyes talked about how the minerals, the very earth of the country was her uh, palette. And her, she wanted her pots to be about the country itself. So um, it's kind of a, a good way of introducing this concept of the very earth, the materials, rather than images of plants and animals or, uh, or people, um, being the kind of way of expressing uh, country, if you yeah. like, yeah. Uh, within ceramics. Yeah, so using, um, using the, yeah, the minerals and the products of the earth as an expression as opposed to taking uh, pictures of landscapes and putting them on there. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah right. So, uh, so, so, you know, the, the, all, the colours of all, all of these sort of beautiful um, platters and bowls are all uh, purely the colours of, of minerals sourced yeah. in Australia. And so for Ireland, Keys that kind of spoke to the, to the Western Australian landscape and of it. And Eileen worked uh, closely with um, another pioneer potter from Western Australia, um, Joan Campbell. And jo Joan and Eileen both experimented with um, wood firing. So this is once again getting back to that kind of spontaneous truth to materials thing. Uh, with wood firing, you don't have a lot of control over the eventual result. 
Um, so you, you're leading, leaving some to chance. Uh, so it's very much about the kind of a, the process and the materials. Uh, so Joan Campbell, uh, she went to the United States to study wood firing. She was one of the first Australians um, to use the technique. So um, <clears throat> with wood firing, of course, uh, the process is uh, you're using wood and sometimes other materials to, um, to fire the clay as opposed to gas or electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that's, and that affects the surface and produces decorative, decorative or, 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 or textural qualities. Not textural, but decorative uh, you know, colours and patterns. So Joan Campbell uh, was very keen to represent um, the Western Australian landscape kind of itself, so she sort of uh, does represent it sculpturally, if you like, as well as uh, using indigenous materials. So um, Joan's work is also some of the earliest purely sculptural work um, produced in Australia, uh, you know, that's non-figurative. Mm. So the colours that we're seeing on, on the um, surface there, it, it's all, that's all a result of the, how the materials reacted to the heat. It's not something that she's painted on afterwards yeah, so there, or yeah, anything. There, yeah. are, there are no glazes. These are the results of the flame and, and the gases produced by the fire yeah. playing over the surface of the clay. Yeah. So this fantastic uh, object, which I've always seen out of the corner of my eye in the store, I just ne never had the opportunity to display. This, was the, this is the first chance I've ever had. Yeah. Uh, it's a truly, you know, monumental work. Yeah, and quite large. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So you can see by the title, Western Landscape and uh, Darling Ranges, that they're quite explicitly referencing particular landscapes in Western Australia. Great. So maybe we'd go have a look over here at this, these. Yeah, so an interesting, strange objects. yeah, an interesting contrast to Joan Campbell's work is the work of uh, Vincent McGrath, a Tasmanian ceramicist, uh, also working in a in a sculptural mode. But Vincent McGrath was very interested in was interested equally interested in places, Joan Campbell, but uh, also interested in, in industrial places and in how industrial landscapes are being changed by by um, human occupation and presence. Um, so. These two, uh, one of them is Talar and one of them is Waratah, both mining towns in Tasmania. And he's used, uh, you know, um, uh, fire brick, clay, and other kind of materials to kind of create a sort of a, uh, a representation, I guess, of, of altered landscapes and industrial processes. Yeah. And both very sculptural, you know, without any um, function apart from... Absolutely no decorative. function yeah. whatsoever, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. This way. <laughs> so more, uh, more investigation into the landscape or use of the landscape as... Yes. Motive, yeah. yeah, so um, I mentioned before that there was a strong influence in the studio pottery practice of uh, Chinese and Japanese ceramics, particularly Japanese ceramics. Um, so uh, in a, there were a couple of Japanese ceramicists who visited, who, who actually lived in Australia um, during this period. And uh, so Shiga Shigo was one of them. And this is kind of an interesting representation of landscape, this particular vase, because um, you can see it's quite kind of sharp and coarse and rough, it's kind of, it's not super friendly, um, <clears throat> and Shige Shigo, this is, was his kind of representation of Australia, particularly the Sydney landscape, after being kind of in Japan, you know, a, a, a country of kind of lush green vegetation and, and mostly wooden, soft wooden architecture, and uh, when he moved to Sydney it was a dry landscape and there's a lot of brick, a lot of brick and tile, a kind of yeah. scratchy, sort yeah. of harsh landscape, and um, this vase is a kind of representation of his feelings about that. Wow. And he, he was enormously influential in Australian pottery. Uh, he taught a lot of people. And another Japanese teacher, his um, 
still living in the uh, ACT, area, ACT area is Hiro Ishwen. Um, very different sort of practice. The large vase here is a representation of Sydney Heads yeah. as a landscape, so uh, you know, quite abstracted. Um, this is a, a form she uses quite a bit, so really uh, it's the, the sort of areas of dark and the, and the floating birds that kind of um, evoke the sense of landscape. Yeah, and a tiny hole in the top of your vase to put one flower in. <laughs> uh, yes, or, or, a, or a, a, a um, branch with blossoms. Yeah. Which alone on a sideboard against a snark wall. Yeah, thank okay. you. look lovely. Yes, yeah. And um, what about this brick here? Uh, the brick's by a ta Tasmanian potter. Um, whose name I have to just go quickly check. No, right. It's a morel, but I just need to do his first name. Yes. Michael Morel, sorry, yes. So he did a series of these. These are totally non functional as well, so they're actually hollow underneath. And um, just representing landscape pictorially, if you like, in a similar way to the, um, to the uh, deep bowl here by Wendy Mulber and the Tasmanian Potter. Over in the back here, though, um, there's a couple of fabulous. Vases by Pippin Drysdale, and I'll just uh, I'll just use my phone to cast a little bit of extra light on these, because um, they really are incredibly delicate in both that sort of striated um, linear patterning and also in the sort of shading of the colours and the beautiful polished surfaces. So these are these are um, part of that. Look, a series she did on the Tanami Desert. Um, so she's representing the desert uh, once again in quite an abstract way. Um, in um, you know, uh, essentially it's kind of colour and line, I guess, um, and with a sort of beautiful glow inside as well. Yeah. So this case is kind of about looking at landscapes different ways of looking at landscapes yep. different, um, and different people looking at lands landscapes. Japanese migrants to Australia, uh, the, the desert um, and uh, the Jeff Minchin pot here is also another, he's a, a South Australian artist, another exploration of the desert theme, um, sort of a bit like aerial views if you like with a sort of a, a, a pattern, a linear pattern on a sort of a mottled green surface. Yeah. I can't imagine building that. That would be quite a challenge, I think, to get you to, to get your clay to stand up like that, to mm. build a perfect cube and it at that size as well. It's pretty well, impressive. He's, yeah, he's he's uh, he's been practicing strikes for quite a few decades okay. and he's one of uh, South Australia's most revered um, potters. Yeah. Uh, and still exploring landscape. Um, uh, his more recent work looks at bushfire, yep. bushfire ravaged landscapes, funnily enough. Um, yeah, so th this, uh, I guess, you know, this is a kind of a, f a fragmentation of voices from a sort of modernist consensus, if you like. Um, and then, then we move sort of into postmodernism. And uh, this is my favourite case. <laughs> <laughs> is it because of the colour? It is because of the colour, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and I think we'll, we'll just start with Margaret Dodd around here. And this fabulous F.J. Holden. So this is a, this is a, a fabulous um, sculptural piece. And Margaret Dodd, she... Um, this is a, she, she... She's kind of a funk a funk ceramicist, and that was a movement that began in the US, um, where you, you know, sort of related to, to uh, pop art yeah. as well. And um, she took this, this sort of icon of Australianness, the car, and um, used it to kind of critique, if you like, Australian culture. Yeah. Um, from two angles, actually. One of them was kind of the macho aspects of the car culture, but also um, the fact that the car is really actually an American car. Right. So, you know, and, and it was sort of an American 
imperialism, imperialism if you like. So um, it's, a, it's kind of a layered, a layered thing. She, she produced many of these cars uh, as, as the actual car as a bride, cars as different characters. Um, so what about this incredible bowl up here? Yeah, so that's by, actually by, a, um, by a, a, an artist who migrated from England and actually migrated back to England. So she's, she's not in, England, in Australia anymore. And um, this is like uh, almost a return to the tradition that we saw in the, in the, um, the mid-century potteries with these kind of fabulously bright birds um, and bright colours, mm -hmm. of course. Um, but even, I, I think, you know, arguably more colourful yeah. than those, pretty sort of wild. Um, and I think intentionally kind of humorous. These birds have a lot of personality, a lot of chewed. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're kind of presented in, uh, you know, as, as quite dynamic characters. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a fabulous, yeah. fabulous pot. I particularly um, love the um, legs on it and the different colours yeah. of each of the three legs. With the, yeah. Well, of course, you know, I guess the thing about postmodernism is the return of representation. Yeah. So uh, of a fairly explicit, explicit kind. Um, and also the, the historical reference, which you can see very strongly here in the Stephen Bowers teapot, which for Australianness has a lovely cockatoo next to Robbie the robot in blue and white, referring to the great tradition of historical ceramics. So what about this beautiful vase behind me? these Tasmanian Waratahs on it. They are indeed. And the landscape running around the bottom is Lake Dobson, uh, a Tasmanian in Tasmania. Um, so this is a, a very recent work produced last year. Yep. And um, by uh, Catherine Franzi, who uh, also had an exhibition at the Botanical Gardens here last year. And um, the really nice thing about this is it combines uh, both are kind of really uh, uh, accurate and um, sensitive portrayal of the plant with a kind of historical feeling, uh, sort of referencing sort of the Woodblock Prince of Margaret Preston and, um, and that sort of a very strong graphic tradition that once again actually comes originally out of Japan. So um, <clears throat> she, she, I think she very subtly and very successfully layers those those references in, never losing track of the actual plant, mm. which is kind of, you know, beautifully portrayed. Yeah, the red against the black and white definitely makes it mm. pop as well. Yeah. Yes, and it's got a beautiful texture. Just want to... Yeah, you want to touch it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't. No. <laughs> Great, well, where to next? Um, how many have time? We, do we need to? We've got a couple more minutes. A couple more minutes? Yeah, a oh, okay. couple more. Um, so, um, also since the kind of, I guess, the 90s mainly, um, there's been quite a kind of resurgence, or certainly a, a resurgence in, well, actually, resurgence is not the right word, but there's been a um, certainly a, a strong interest in Australian Indigenous art, um, during Aboriginal art, and um, quite a flowering, if you like, in response to that as well. Um, and that's kind of, kind of interesting in this context of talking about identity because obviously um, in the sort of settler, settler colonial context, if you like, um, issues of identity are tricky for the colonists and their descendants and also for subsequent migrants, but they have a completely different sort of quality for Indigenous Australians, mm. um, which I won't particularly speak to because that's not my... Um, uh, well, I just can't do that. Mm. <laughs> but, um, but in terms of, for example, um, ceramics, this beautiful uh, pot by Judith in Kamala, 
from Hermansburg. Um, so uh, actually making fire ceramics is not a traditional practice in the area and really has been going on since the 90s. But, um, and, and there are a number of artists uh, who, who work in this mode with this sort of characteristic um, vessel with a sort of pictorial decoration on the outside and um, a sort of sculptural finial lid on the top. And the pictorial decoration on the outside is always sort of beautifully resolved across the surface um, and has a kind of lovely fluid character to it. And then um, there's kind of an element of humour as well, humour and life in the, um, in the finials and in the, and, and in the um, figures. There are all sorts of subjects uh, used. But and um, just keeping it very kind of uh, <laughs> brief, yep. um, there's this lovely fish trap by, actually I need to check. Mm. Um, See if I can find which it combine, you. which is kind of interesting hybrid object because uh, it's by Audrey Frost. Yes, by a Tasmanian um, indigenous artist uh, by the name of Audrey Frost. But it's it's not a Tasmanian form, and it's made from New Zealand flax. So it's got a kind of lovely hybrid. It's using a material from New Zealand. It's a form from um, uh, mainland Australian Aboriginal culture, and it's made by a Tasmanian artist, and kind of speaks to. Uh, kind of the fluidity of exchange, if you like. Yeah. Um, the kind of longest design practice in Australia and, you know, presumably in the world is the uh, Australian Aboriginal design practice. They've been designing objects for use and decoration and ceremonial purposes for tens of thousands of years. Yeah. So, la should we lastly have a look at this representation of a fish basket as well. Yes, so this is a lovely kind of uh, example of, of a sort of hybridisation, if, if you like, as well. So it's using a really classic glass technique, um, which is this uh, weaving of canes um, that uh, is, um, you know, goes back to kind of the sort of best glass blowing traditions of Venice. Um, but it's using them in a, in a kind of very appropriate way to represent um, a traditional um, fish basket. And so, so, you know, the canes are woven, the fish baskets are woven, mm. um, and it's a, an extremely sort of complicated process of layering mm. clear glass and the woven pattern areas That's to produce. Really exquisite. Yeah, and then uh, one of the really nice things is the way the, the light on the inside works, uh, you know, it's transmitted and then onto the pattern below. Amazing. Well, I think that might be it for now. Um, the good thing is though that we have actually reopened so you can come in um, and check out the rest of this exhibition. There's lots more that we haven't even managed to touch on yet. Um, so you can do that by going onto our web page and making a booking. Uh, thank you, Peter, again, for uh, your insight into all these beautiful objects. And thanks as well to the friends of TMAG who have um, funded this um, Facebook Live event. And thank you to Kath for filming. And we hope to see you um, in the flesh here at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery again soon. Bye.